the title of this is red team engagements training your blue team to hunt adversaries and i had the pleasure of working with madhav and brad um in the weeks leading up to here i mentioned earlier that you know being part of a sand summit whether it's your first time speaking or your 100th time um the advisory board helped us out one choosing all the talks making sure that there was a flow but then also making sure that the slides were good that we gave you dry runs and gave you feedback and as i was going through this talk i one loved it and two it's a little bit of a maturity model here as well right and of course we saw tim schultz talk uh, about the maturity model and 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 one way of doing it and i think just as an industry and all of you that are here today right we've had 6000 some people registered it's like everyone's getting the importance of working together right the collaboration and maybe we did it just as like a one off exercise or even a red team exercise uh, like tony just talked about but we're done with that exercise and then what's next what do we do next and just as a community we are collaborating with each other and sharing right so uh madav and brad have gone off and they're trying some stuff over at credit karma uh other folks are trying other things and we're all bringing it back and sharing the different things of what works what doesn't work and uh it's just very very purple and i love it so without further ado want to introduce two offensive security engineers uh from credit karma that have an amazing presentation for you matt have and brad please take it away thanks josh for introducing us we are very excited to be here so uh welcome good afternoon everyone welcome to our presentation on red team engagements training your blue team to hunt adversaries i'm madhu with me is my colleague brad uh, during this presentation we're going to talk about a maturity model that you can practically deploy and used to continuously improve your detection and response process. This is obviously the, not the only way to do it, but this is how we went about it. So a little bit about ourselves. Uh, I'm an offensive security engineer at Great Karma. On the left side, what you see is my Twitter handle. I occasionally blog on Medium. Some of the things we'll talk about, uh, you can find on my Medium blog post. And I sometimes write new tools, one of the tools that we'll talk about during this presentation. And I'll hand it over to Brad to introduce himself. Thanks, Mato. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Brad Richardson. I'm an OFSEC engineer currently at Credit Karma. And uh, you'll see there my Twitter handle at RichardJB. I blog at uh, Medium, uh, where I like to, to post practical and interesting security ideas or interesting to me. Um, when I have free time, I like to write security tools uh, that I think would be helpful to the community. And uh, my most recent tool is called Slackhound, which is like a uh, Slack reconnaissance tool. So uh, check it out. Next slide, please. So uh, first things first, a uh, little disclaimer. Uh, the opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints expressed by the authors, that's us, um, of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints of our employer. So with that out of the way, We'll talk a little bit about our vision and our vision is really to arm the blue team with the capability to take an isolated alert investigate it to identify a chain of events track it down and ultimately flush the attacker out of the network so for example security wants a robust detection and response for pass the hash if the blue team receives a high fidelity pass the hash detection they are able to identify whether the host that attempted to pass the hash is the initial point of com compromise. If not, identify how the attacker laterally moved to this host, being it's not the initial point of compromise. And also we wanna arm them with the ability to find the initial point of compromise and any subsequent compromises to again, ultimately flush the attacker out of the network. So to talk about a little bit more in depth about how we achieve our vision. I'll turn it back to Mato. Thanks, Brad. So in order to achieve our vision, we broke down our maturity model in uh, four phases, uh, detection chart, purple team exercise, adversary detection pipeline, and adversarial, adversarial services life cycle. I'll use a little bit of soccer slash football analogy here. Say you wanna play a 90 minutes of soccer game, right? Then the basic requirement is you have to be match fit and you have to practice your basic skills like dribbling, passing, shooting, and tackling. 
So the first three phase, detection chart, purple team exercise, adversary detection pipeline, this phase is make you match fit and help you practice you know, those basic skills. And then adversarial services life cycle is the friendly match between red and blue that helps blue team prepare against actual match against actual adversaries. So without further ado, let's jump into the first phase. First phase is detection chart. And if you look at this, you, it feels like you know four different paint buckets exploded on MITRE attack framework. Obviously, there's a method to the madness. So let's understand what is detection chart. So detection chart is basically, you know, it shows the detection strength of a TTP on the scale of zero to three. So if we take an example of bit admin TTP, which is T1197, uh, if you don't detect bit admin TTP at all, you associate with a uh, score of zero. If you do detect bit admin TTP, but not its variation, like for example, third util is one of the variation. You can put carrots between B, I, T, S, and your EDI token or AV token can miss that. If those kind of things happen, then you associate with a uh, bit admin DTP a score of one. If you do detect bit admin DTP and its variation, you associate a score of two. And if that DTP is not applicable to your environment, uh, point in case if you are Mac only shop, you don't have to worry about bit admin, you associate a score of three. Now, uh, MITRE attack has a lot of TTPs and you can't do this for every single TTP because you'll have to test out every single TTP to associate the score. So you'll have to prioritize the list of TTPs that you want to test for. And in order to do that, you have to know your environment and combine it you know, with your experience as a red teamer to prioritize the list of TTPs. So once you have you know, prioritized the list of TTPs, let's talk about how we can build a detection chart. The process is very straightforward. Uh, first thing you'll need is uh, VMs with gold image for Linux and Windows. For MacBook, obviously, you know, maybe VMs won't work out, so you might really need a test MacBook with a gold image. Then you pick a TTP from that prioritized list of TTPs. You gather the unit tests for, this, the, for that TTP, and the great source is obviously Atomic Red Team, but you also want to add your custom test from your own experience as a Red Team. Then you run those tests on the gold image, and at this point, automation will be your friend. The more you can automate, the better. And then you go and validate if the alert is triggered or not. One thing I want to clarify, uh, when we were talking about detection in the slide before, when we use the word detection, we are actually looking for an alert to be triggered. Uh, if you see the IOC is in the log, but the alert is not triggered, we rate it as not detected. So uh, just um, you know, mental note of thinking detection as an alert here. And once you validate whether the alert is triggered or not, you can rate it from between zero to two uh, based on the previously mentioned criteria. Obviously we are not testing for the TTP that are not applicable, which is a score of three. And when you are done with all the TTPs in your list, uh, it will build a foundation for the next phase, which is the purple theme exercise. Before we move into the next phase, I'm gonna talk about a tool. Uh, I wrote detection navigator. I used to maintain detection chart using spreadsheet and it is not at all scalable. So I wrote a Django-based web server uh, that helps me you know, maintain and update uh, whenever new TTPs are released by MITRE or a new version of MITRE is um, released. Uh, you can check it out on the GitHub page or on my blog post. Uh, I won't talk about it a whole lot of year in the interest of time. <clears throat> but when you are done with the detection chart phase, uh, you would have achieved following. One, you would have prioritized list of TTPs that are applicable to your environment. You would provide transparency to your leadership uh, in how good or bad you are at detecting uh, techniques used by attackers. And uh, you would have performed a gap analysis that will sort of help you prioritize the resources that are needed in your environment. And as a bonus, you can use this technique to evaluate EDR tools. MITRE does this whenever you know, vendors submit their EDR tools to MITRE, MITRE tests it against known thread group TTPs. And you can uh, do this in-house if you like uh, for the EDR tools that are not evaluated by MITRE. It will sort of, sort of give you, you know, your own view on the EDR tool. Phase two, purple team exercise. This is a purple team summit. Before us and tomorrow, there are some great in-depth talk on how to do purple team exercise. I will not go in very much detail on how to do purple team exercise, but what we are gonna do is we'll just take an example and walk you through it on what it would look like doing purple team exercise. So what you will do is your detection chart, you'll pick a TTP that needs detection. Uh, you will figure out what kind of IOCs are generated uh, with that TTP. 
Uh, those IOCs can be network level artifact, host level artifact, application level artifact. Depending on what kind of IOCs are generated, you will either work with a network engineer or a system administrator or an application or to have those artifacts locked to your SIM. Then you will work with a SIM expert to build a SIM query. You will test and review that SIM query. We'll talk in detail about testing and reviewing the next phase, testing in phase four and reviewing in phase three. But let's just say that the query meets your standard for testing and review. You will deploy the query and you just build a detection using purple theme exercise. So, you know, let's make this more digestible uh, using an example. And what better example to use than DC sync? Uh, absolute worst nightmare for any company and absolute favorite attack of every red teamer. So for on-prem uh, domain controller, if you do DC sync, it generates IOCs at the network level and the host level. So if we go back to this chart, we have picked a TTP that is DC sync and we have identified IOCs generated at network level and host level. So now we'll work with a network engineer and a domain admin to get those IOCs in the SIM. Then we'll work with a SIM expert to build a SIM query to look for those requests that are not coming from the domain controller. We'll test and review that SIM query. And if it meets our standard, we'll deploy it for detection. Obviously, it's never as easy as it sounds. There are always challenges. And we'll, you know, we'll talk one challenge each for a network level detection and host level detection. At network level, you want to make sure that all the network traffic going to DC goes to the network device that is responsible for sending the slots. And at the host level, uh, whenever domain admins would add a new DC, since you're filtering out DCs in your query, it might just happen that it will flirt your blue team with false positives. So you want to make sure that you build, have a working relationship with your system administrator team so that whenever they deploy a new domain controller, you update your query to make sure it doesn't flirt your blue team. Obviously, depending on your environment, you might run into different challenges. And depending on the TTPs, uh, these challenges would change. But the, uh, one of the most important things that can come out of the purple team is that it will give you a better understanding of your environment and your tools. So once you are done with this phase, you would have achieved following. Uh, you would have improved your detection capabilities. This is obviously a recurring process to validate detections. None of these phases really ever really end. You know, They are all recurring. You would just be visiting them at different point in time, depending on where you are at. And it forces your red team to improve. So they might, they wouldn't be able to use commodity TTPs anymore. You know, they would probably have to use some custom TTPs. And as a bonus, it provides insight into the value and effectiveness of the tools you are using. So say for example, in the previous example, the network device that is IDS is responsible for sending those DC sync logs to your SIM. And hypothetically, if that IDS can't see DC sync packets, well, it's time to change the IDS. And next time you are evaluating the IDS, you would bake that into your questionnaire and you would make sure that you are getting the logs needed to you know, make sure that you get to do the detections that you need. Phase three, adversary detection pipeline. Uh, this phase can go parallel to purple team exercise. Uh, the main difference is purple team exercise, red teams are heavily involved. Adversary detection pipeline, not so much, uh, except for maybe the review phase. So uh, let's let's see what the workflow looks like. So again, you know, we in the first phase we build the foundation for uh, our detections, which was the detection chart. The TTPs that need detection would go in the tickets backlog of uh, enterprise software like ServiceNow Jira. Then those tickets will get assigned to a blue team member, or a blue team member can pick a TTP they want to work on, and it will move to in progress. Uh, blue team members can look at the TTP, identify the IOCs. Uh, think, uh, you know, come up with a logic to detect those IOCs, and then they'll create a query that represents that logic. Once they feel confident about the same query they have written, uh, they'll go to the review committee. This is the review that we talked about uh, in the phase two slide uh, of the test and review. Uh, in the next slide, we'll see what review committee looks like, but review committee, uh, if the standard are met for the same query, they can accept it or reject it. If the query is rejected, blue team member can take the feedback, work on that feedback and come back to the review committee. If, if the query is obviously accepted, then blue team members work is done. Uh, this query gets handed off to your SIM expert. Uh, and once it gets deployed to the SIM, the sprint is complete. So again, let's make this more digestible using an example. Let's try a deck SSH spray using this detection pipeline. So first this, you know, DDB will go in the ticket backlog. 
say you get a Sherlock Holmes on your blue team, right? Obviously the best person to have in the blue on your blue team, the best investigator ever. Sherlock gets assigned this ticket. Sherlock looks at the DDP and like, eh, this is easy. You know, it generates network level IOC, it generates host level IOC, and comes up with the logic that you see on the right top side. Uh, network level logic, multiple SSH connection, different destination of same source IP, and host level logic, multiple failed SSH logins, different usernames, and same source IP in the short period of time. Then Sherlock writes a query that represents this logic, and Sherlock is confident, so Sherlock goes to the review committee. Before Sherlock goes to the review committee, Sherlock should have answered the following questions ready. First, is there a run book for this alert? So the junior analyst can follow steps when that alert is triggered. Second, what is the proposed maturity of this detection? Experimental or stable? If it is experimental, Sherlock is gonna work every alert until it becomes stable. Uh, how often will it fire? And what is the false positive rate? These two questions are you know, designed so that we don't waste our blue team's time or flood them with alerts. And the last two questions, in my opinion, are the most important question. And this is where, as a red teamer, you can chime in. First is, is there an alternate scenario which can trigger this alert? So if you, you know, closely look at the network level logic, a simple NMAP scan for SSH will trigger that alert. And you know, when it comes to response, context is very crucial. So it is important to know the alternate scenario which can trigger the alert and maybe modify the alert accordingly too, if it, it's an option. And the last question, is there a way this logic can be bypassed? You'll not find a silver bullet for every single TDP. Uh, if you do, that's great. But uh, in, the, in the cases you may not, you wanna be aware of them and you can probably put some other mitigating controls in place uh, to you know, make sure that it can't be bypassed. But you know, once Sherlock has answered this question to the review committee, and obviously this is not the extensive list of questions, you can have more or less questions in your review committee. So once these questions are answered, if the review committee feels like, you know what, this query uh, meets our standards, it'll, you know, Sherlock's work is done, it will be handed off to the SIM SME, and SIM SME deplo deploys the content, the sprint is complete, voila, we just turned out a detection using adversary detection pipeline. So at the end of this phase, and again, these are all recurring phases, they never really end, uh, you would have achieved following. Uh, agile content and creation process, I know I'm just throwing out big, big words, but, but it is indeed agile. It creates self-sufficiency for your blue team. This is very helpful when your relative resources are limited. And the last, the most important piece is a documented trail on how the content was created and you know, it's service now or Jira. Uh, this is helpful when the person who created the detection either left the company or you wanna go back and update the detection or you wanna audit them. This documented trail comes really handy. So now that you know, we have sort of become match fit and practice the basic skills, I'll hand it over to Brad on how to do the friendly match between Brad and Blue. Thanks. So let's talk about the adversarial services lifecycle. So what you see on this slide is how we envision the adversarial services lifecycle end to end. If you look to the left, we start there with the planning phase and we finish on the right with validating that we have both robust detections and responses. We'll talk more about each of these steps in later slides, but for now, we specifically want to note that the red team performs planning and trains the blue team, exercises the detection and response controls during the execution step, and helps with the AARs, which is really just a military term. You can kind of think of it like uh, a little bit of an improvement plan. There's more to it than that. And we'll talk about it. Um, but we believe that the red team has the opportunity to improve the security posture. Um, also in here by driving remediation for all those great assessment findings um, that came out of the execution step. So next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, prerequisite and the planning. Here's really um, a way to ensure a good red team exercise. And it'll ensure that leadership sees the security value with what uh, the team is doing. Uh, it'll keep the red team ultimately out of legal trouble and uh, so if you look to the left, you're going to see uh, what we consider uh, the major milestones in the planning and prereq phase. And on the right, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about examples of those. So you see 
Um, the obje objectives defined by executives or leadership, um, red teaming, adversarial services is objective-based, scenario-based. Um, in that, we want to uh, determine our rules of engagement. Uh, we want to run both the objectives and our rules of engagement through our legal department um, to ensure that you know we we stay legal and out of trouble. Uh, we want to, in this phase, establish our timeline for emulating the different phases that we're going to target from, say, attack. And uh, if we have the luxury of a white cell, uh, we're going to establish that white cell, that team that uh, will help mediate between red and blue. If we have the luxury of a green cell, uh, a team that maybe can manage the red team infrastructure uh, during the exercise, we'll go ahead and establish that team as well. And then one thing that we really think is important is that uh, in this step, you would deploy your C2 infrastructure. Uh, this will ensure that um, when you get into execution, uh, the actual red team engagement, um, you're not on the clock and burning lots of cycles in time, uh, trying to deploy uh, C2 and redirectors, all those good things, and taking away from uh, your exercise minutes. So on the right side, you see examples of what we just talked about. So our objectives, uh, these are the things that keep, um, you know, your managers or your uh, leadership teams up at night and things that might go into that, right? Like um, uh, we're going to start from the outside. Um, we're going to work our way into the network. Um, you know, how we're going to do that is um, we'll uh, potentially send out uh, spear phishing, uh, but ultimately our scenario is to see if we can access intellectual property. And then we'll define like rules of engagement. So uh, this group of employees is uh, in scope and this group of employees is out of scope. And what's our target net network range? Um, how would we uh, stop the engagement if we needed to? And then we'll you know lay out a little bit of a timeline. So for example, June 8th to June 14th, we're gonna work on that phase of establishing initial foothold. This is how we'll attempt to do that. 15th through 21st of June, uh, we'll run through persistence, uh, data collection, discovery, uh, credential access. And we'll do that in, to ensure that we time box each of our uh, scenario phases. Um, and that way, it'll just help protect that, that uh, our engagement and exercise keeps moving along. And that if we get stuck, you know, maybe we'll use a white card, um, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but ultimately, we don't get hung up on one phase and end up losing valuable assessments in other phases. So this just keeps it moving along. So next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit about the execution and the AARs. Um, in our execution phase, again, on the left side, these are the things we think very critical. Uh, we want to strictly follow the rules of engagement that we've uh, had signed off on and have agreement to. Um, one thing is really critical. We do not want to obstruct the blue team's ability to investigate. For example, let's say, you know, red team decides to turn off EDR tools. Um, you know, if the blue team can't investigate, it just defeats the whole purpose of the exercise, really reduces, you know, the value of it. So we don't want to do anything that would blind the blue team. Now, if uh, red team's uh, operating and doesn't get caught easily, maybe we want to increase uh, the level of noise. So blue team can uh, find some IOCs um, to hunt by, look for the red team, right? Because um, that's what we want for a good exercise. So if red team isn't getting caught. What can red team do to ensure that blue team is getting that value in walking through those steps? Um, and of course, if the red team gets stuck in a certain phase and just can't complete it, you know, we don't want to keep just um, banging on uh, that phase. Um, you know, white card it, document it in your uh, findings report. Uh, just make sure you mention it there um, and move on. Uh, there might be different reasons why uh, you need to white card a certain phase, um, but again, keep the exercise moving. And then on the right side, you see just effective um, AARs, after action reviews. Um, again, kind of like uh, an improvement plan, but there's more to it than that. So we talk about the major sections that we want to include. So what went well, what didn't go well, what can be improved, and how do we plan for future success for everybody involved?
So you see there, just as an example of what went well, for the red team, the redirector is located near headquarters, um, obfuscated uh, the, our infrastructure and made it more challenging for blue. And on uh, the blue side, um, blue team correctly identified a red team SMB password spray of a compromised account and host. Uh, there's a, a blue team win. So uh, these are basic examples, um, but we really want to show you know how these can be used effectively. And you're documenting uh, what comes out of these um, exercises so that it's not lost. And you can show value back to uh, your leadership and the team, and it's all collected here. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about remediation. Um, here's another great place that Red Team can provide value. Remediation's hard. <laughs> Most people don't want to do remediation, um, but the Red Team can ensure that the remediation efforts improve the overall security posture and that those improvements really add to attacker pain, which is something that the Red Team uh, maybe knows better than any other security function, uh, function attack, attacker pain. So we'll talk a little bit about remediation. We tend to break these down into two major groups. Um, so you think about prevention and detection and response. Uh, prevention, anything that really denies, um, degrades, disrupts the attacker's tactics, costing them time and stealth. So a couple of examples there, right? MFA, great preventative control. Network segmentation, definitely a best practice. Um, if you increase your password complexity or make stronger passwords, harder for the attackers to crack those hashes, right? And then in terms of detection and response, this is really anything that involves collection, the monitoring uh, for bypass of those preventative controls, as well as things that maybe we just can't prevent, uh, but we need to be able to detect and respond. So take, for example, Otto was talking about DC sync, not a really good way out there to necessarily prevent this, um, but we can detect it and we can have a robust response when that detection fires. MFA bypass, MFA, no doubt, a really good security control, um, but we all know that there are bypasses out there for MFA. And then living off the land, um, you know, attackers abusing legitimate accounts, maybe those uh, accounts are admin accounts. So this is a normal activity, harder to uh, find, um, but we wanna be able to detect and respond if this occurs. So now here, uh, looking at our workflow, we're looking a little bit more at the right side this time. Um, now in, in our workflow steps, uh, you're really seeing from remediation to validation. And we'll be taking our TTPs used in the red team exercise uh, during that execution step. Those will be the basis of our unit test to build new or better detections. Now, uh, whether our TTPs are mapped easily to MITRE or attack, uh, or let's say that they're custom, uh, it doesn't really matter. Our purple team exercises and detection pipeline processes still work for building and testing the detection from either uh, place that those might come from. So during our unit test that you see there, um, the unit test for detection part, we will rerun the TTPs uh, using our red team engagement um, to ultimately validate that our alerts fire or trigger. Now, once we have high fidelity detections, we will do a blind test. Another place where red team comes back in uh, specifically using those TTPs again uh, to validate that we have adequate response. And so uh, last but not least, um, you can show progress and value uh, by recording the difference, uh, say with mean time to detect or mean time to respond um, during the engagement, right? And how those metrics improve at the end. Uh, so for example, um, you collect, it, uh, collect those times during your remediation or the operation, maybe um, no alert was triggered when the red team was actually uh, doing the engagement. Uh, but now um, you've built the detections, uh, you've tested and validated for response. So let's say now uh, you've gone from not detecting this TTP at all to now you've detected and responded within nine minutes. It's gonna be very hard to say that the team's not improving when you can show metrics and numbers like that. So next slide, please. 
So uh, our adversarial services lifecycle in the end, it provides us feedback on the all that great work uh, completed during uh, phase one, two, and three that we talked about. It trains our blue team to engage, track, and hunt for actual adversaries. And the remediation phase um, ensures improvements in those um, critical controls and our posture. And of course, strong prevention and detections are really the foundation of a strong response. So in closing, we believe this methodology will help you train the blue team to proactively hunt. For example, take um, whatever exploit is released, say for a zero day, uh, blue team will have a methodology to proactively hunt with OI, uh, IOCs from uh, the zero day and build detections from the IOCs. And that could go for any zero day or uh, vulnerability exploit. And of course, all phases that we've talked about are methodically linked. Uh, Motto talked about that they are recurring and provide for continuous security posture, especially um, in areas of uh, detection and response um, for our improvement. And uh, last, um, this really builds transparency and provides it to uh, your management and your leadership uh, and your security organization. So in the things that we've talked about, um, you're going to be able to uh, show them uh, your current posture. Uh, you're going to be able to give a much clearer, uh, bigger picture. Uh, you're gonna be able to talk and demonstrate in terms of security value uh, to them, helping them understand um, where budget is being spent and the value of the investments. And ultimately, all of this is going to be supported with the things that we've talked about. Uh, you're going to have uh, more metrics. You're going to have documentation, um, the AARs. Uh, you're going to have increased communication and alignment because of these things. And ultimately, you're going to have, you know, your red team reporting and, and all the reporting that comes out of this. Um, and they're going to be able to see that, right? They're going to know um, exactly um, what the teams are doing, how the teams are improving, and what uh, value is being returned. And uh, next slide. And, and so uh, with that, um, we'd like to give a big thanks to SANS uh, and everyone for attending our talk. We really appreciate it, uh, and thanks for listening to us. Thank you all so much. That was great. What a great way to wrap up our day one. Uh, the most asked question, what is AAR? So um, the after action report, you know, non-military folks did not know, but don't worry. We answered that question on the Slack uh, for you, uh, which begs to ask, did uh, you have some military background, that's why you use that, or it was just inherited through uh, commercial work like it was for me? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I'll let Mato give his answer, but I'll just say first, from my background, um, my experience with the AAR, uh, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to attend a, a military National Guard uh, event uh, known as CyberShield, where I got to be on the red team there. Uh, and that was probably my introduction to AAR, and it's a it's um it's an awesome tool to collect uh, all the information that comes out of uh, these exercises. Yep, and I had the opportunity to attend CyberShield in a different year where I learned this term. Um, if you get, if you ever have an opportunity to attend CyberShield, I would highly recommend it. That's awesome, and yeah, no, I figured uh, I also learned it uh, when I actually came over, started working at Scythe with with Bryson Bort. Uh, who introduced me to that term. So uh, it was just funny, it, you know, lots of people ask for it and they're like, yeah, you know, all the, the acronyms and I didn't catch it when we were going through, but you did end up answering it yourself as we went. But like I said, this was awesome. Thank you all so much, uh, both of you, uh, for spending the time with me during the week. And of course now uh, presenting all this work. So uh, thank you again. Thanks, thank Joe. We really appreciate it. Really appreciate it.